Good afternoon, y'all. This is Hebron Baptist Adult Sunday School. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 24 today, talking about living. Salvation is demonstrated through God-honoring lives. Salvation is demonstrated through God-honoring lives. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your love and mercy toward us. And Father, I just pray you help us to seek to live in such a way that marks us as Christians. We understand there's nothing that we can do other than trust in you that makes us a Christian. But Lord, may we do what marks us as Christians today. Help us to be identified as believers by our love and how it expresses itself toward ourselves, toward you, and toward this life we live. So Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there are things in life that give us an identity. There are things in life that give us an identity. For instance, there's an old license plate here. This identifies the person having this as either being in Texas or from Texas or got their plate in Texas, but they're a Texan in some way. It says the Lone Star State there. So how does a license plate help give a person an identity? It helps you to know where they're from, uh, where they're going, where they're at, who they are. And we have things in life that give us identity. Maybe a pin you wear, maybe the shirt you wear, maybe... The way you talk gives you identity. Well, as Christians, we have things that give us identity as well, and we are marked by those things. They don't make us a Christian, but they mark us as Christians. So let's look at a little context here as we talk about 1 Thessalonians, and we get to the end of 1 Thessalonians. It was Paul's desire for the Christians that they continue to grow in their faith. He was encouraged by how far they had come already. Although they were making a difference in their community and beyond, he knew that God had more in store for them. So in this first letter, Paul challenged them toward a practical application of their faith. He knew that the key to living out the Christian faith was to keep an eye on the future. Think about what was going to happen. How was God going to work in their lives? And with that in mind, he wrote about the rapture of the church and the return of Jesus Christ. He assured the believers that Jesus was coming back in a way that would be unmistakable. They would know that it was Jesus. When the Lord did return, he would take his people away with him, both the living and the dead from every nation. Paul noted that those who did live in expectation of Christ's return will be surprised. Those who did not, is what I meant to say. Those who did not live in expectation of Christ's return, looking forward to it, would be surprised by his arrival. It would come like a thief in the night and they would face the consequences of rejecting him. That's why it's important for Paul and Thessalonians to stay alert and watchful and to always look for Jesus' return. <clears throat> so we're in the final section of 1 Thessalonians here. Paul gives them 15 different exhortations, encouragements, commands that he says, look, if you're believers in Christ, if you're really longing for Christ's return, this is how you need to be behaving or do this. He challenged them to focus on these basic practices that would help their faith to grow. And he told them several things to do and a few things to avoid. And spiritual maturity was Paul's deepest desire for them. So, and hopefully you can see that little drawing right there. Because I like what it says. Um, as we read the passage, let's make a list of commands Paul included and consider how these commands lead us to honor God in our lives. And if you can see that little drawing there, you notice it says, the God who commands and enables us to obey. When God calls you to do something, he gives you the strength to do it. And that's a wonderful promise. So let's take a look at these three areas, respecting, accountable, and sanctified. Respecting accountable and sanctified let's take a look at verses 12 and 13 it speaks about those who lord over them or rule over them or who are over them in the lord in the church and we urge you brethren to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake be at peace among yourselves <clears throat> How does showing respect for church leaders demonstrate the spiritual health of the church? Well, uh, if they're a godly leader, it really does help a lot. I'm going to take that thing down so it won't be a distraction there. If they're a godly leader, it helps out a lot. 
You want them to be laboring among you, not, not over you, but among you. You want them warning you. You want them to be in the Lord. You, they're your leader in the Lord. They may not be your boss at work, but they are to spiritually guide you. And you're to esteem them, consider them very highly in love for the sake of their work. Not necessarily for them, but you consider them high for their work's sake. And in doing this, there'll be peace among all of you. So I think that's why it's so important. Show respect to those who rule and lead. For no other reason, you show them respect because of the work they're called to do. Then there's accountable. Here's where the second part of our listing comes together. We recognize those who are leaders, but then he gives us a list of things to follow. He says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. <clears throat> now, in our book, it talks about the connection between our private prayer life, our private devotional life, and how it affects the local church. Both of these play together. One, you're never going to be stronger as a church as you are than your membership. If your membership's not a praying membership, if it's not a rejoicing membership, if it's not a thankful membership, you won't be a thankful church. If they're not individually thankful and rejoicing and prayerful, don't expect the church to be that way. And in the same way, it comes back on the membership as well because when new members come in, they have a standard by which they need to shape their lives. So, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. And notice, notice this, that these are, I call this extreme Christianity. This is not, it doesn't say rejoice when times are good. It doesn't say pray when you get a chance. It doesn't say give thanks when you feel like it. It says in every situation, in every situation, in every situation, you rejoice. You pray, uh, you give thanks. You never stop ceasing to do that. If nothing else, you can say to God, thank you, Lord, for what, for what we did. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done in our lives. So how does a person's private prayer life and spiritual behavior affect the life of the local church? How does the behavior of the church affect the believer? Well, think about that. It ought to be affecting us in a positive way. So, some more accountability. We're gonna, we're gonna be extreme in our rejoicing, in our thankfulness, and in our prayer life, we're gonna do these things. So listen to what it says next. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all, See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Here's some more commands. Listen to what they say. He says, I exhort you. I'll give you an exhortation here. Warn those who are unruly. Do you ever have unruly folks in church? Warn them of the dangers of their unruliness. God expects the church to be done decently in order. Uphold the weak. Uphold the weak. Comfort the faint-hearted. Uh, help those in need. Be patient with everyone. I, I want people to be patient with me, and I need people to be. I need to be patient with people. We got to be patient with one another. See that no one renders evil for evil. Isn't it so easy when somebody does something mean to you, you want to do it back to them? Well, don't do that. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. So what makes being patient with other believers such a challenge? Well, because he'll do things like we want to do them. I don't do things like you want to do them sometimes. We've got to be patient with one another. God is, if God is patient with us, we can be patient with one another. So that's so very, very important. And finally, in this accountability area, notice it says, do not quench the Spirit of God. Don't ever take the Spirit of God and say no to Him. You follow Him. You be faithful to Him. You seek to be a fruit-bearing Christian. Exercise your gifts. Be filled with the Spirit. Let that flow out of your life. Don't put a damper on it. Don't throw water on the fire of the Spirit working in your life. You do not quench the Spirit. Don't despise prophecies. That means when the Word of God is preached and you hear the Word of God spoken, you be faithful to the Word of God. Test all things. We talked in Sunday school today about the fact that uh, there are 
are all sorts of news in our world today from all different sources. Who do you trust? Which one is true? Things need to be tested before they need to be trusted, especially when they're outside of the Word of God. The Bible says we ought to trust the Lord with all our heart and don't lean on our own understanding. That means we need to test everything else. So test all things. As you're testing them, hold fast to those things which are good. And then abstain. Notice it doesn't say abstain from evil. It says abstain from every form of evil. So abstain from every form of evil. If something has the appearance of evil, stay away from it. You don't want to be guilty of causing somebody to stumble because you did something that might not have been wrong, but it had an appearance of evil, especially if you know better. Well, Brother John, do Christians really need to act that way? Yes, they do. We ought to be sensitive and mindful to one another and seeking to live a godly and holy life. So what role does the church play in holding others accountable for remaining faithful to God and God's truth? Well, it needs to preach the word. It needs to help hold one another accountable. It needs to be faithful to the word. Local churches have to be strong in the word of God and hold up the word of God. So, accountable. Respect and accountable. And finally, sanctified. Sanctified. What does it mean to be sanctified? I think of the definition of sanctification as leaving this world and cleaving to the kingdom of God, leaving uh, the lies of this world and cleaving to the truth of God's word. It's leaving the, the, the flesh driving us and cleaving to the spirit guiding us. That's what it means to be sanctified. But listen to his prayer. You ought to seek sanctification, but understand it only comes from God. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. We hope when he comes that the wonderful truth is, well, how can my body be preserved blameless? You don't want to do anything in your body that dishonors God. You don't want to do anything in your spirit or your soul that dishonors God. When he comes, when he returns, you want to know that he is seeing someone who has all accounts settled with him and he is right with them. And he says, he who calls you is faithful who also will do it. Now, I'm going to tell you, Paul said in another letter to Timothy, he said, even when we are unfaithful, he is faithful. That is good to know. Our, our Lord is faithful. So think about where you've seen God at work in your life lately. How is he sanctifying you? How does it feel that God will finish what he started? Even if you're unfaithful, he is faithful. We serve a mighty good God. So let me leave you with these two thoughts, and we'll close. First, we should treat other believers in a way that honors God. Pursuing goodness and being thankful honor God. And finally, God's power sanctifies and keeps the believer. We should live at peace with one another. Ask yourself this question. Is there another Christian with whom you're not at peace with right now? Is there another Christian you're not at peace with right now? What are three things you can thank God for right now? Take time to thank God for his blessings. And finally, how can your Bible study group, how can your Christian friends encourage one another to be more obedient to the directives of Paul? And may God help us to be marked by lives lived for Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to Look into your word and see how we ought to live our Christian life. Help us to be faithful to that and help us to grow in your grace and your knowledge. Lord, we humbly ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless.